from the super cheap handles you find on Amazon to the expensive ROG Ally, all the way up to the top skew of an INEO 2S that would set you back well over a lakh, there are so many price points. Android, Linux, Windows, so many operating systems. Then we have the form factors. From the teeny tiny RG Nano all the way up to the behemoth that's the Steam Deck, a huge range here. Add to it handles with a vertical layout, a horizontal layout, screens that flip out. For someone looking to get into handle gaming in 2023, well, yes, it is true that you're going to be spoiled for choice. Things can also get a tiny bit confusing. In today's video, we're going to try to make sense of all of this. What are gaming handles? What can they actually do? What's the right one for you? Hey guys, Ash here from C4E Tech and let's get started. Okay, so for this video, I think the best way to go about it is sorting things via price. Now, I have this divided into seven different price segments. But before we get to that though, to understand gaming handhelds, you're going to have to understand a little bit of console gaming generations. Now, till now, we have nine defined generations of consoles. The first one being something like this, Pong. Yeah, back in the 70s, this is what gaming at home looked like. And the ninth generation is the current one, your PS5s and your Xbox Series Xs. Now, four of these generations in particular are very important. The third generation. If you're a millennial like me, then you'd probably have grown up playing these consoles. You know, the Super Marios and the Contras. These are the ones we called 8-bit, right? The fourth generation is the one we called 16-bit consoles. You know, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, etc. The fifth generation would be late 90s, early 2000s. That is the start of the Sony era with the PlayStation 1. And from here, the generations are very easy to calculate. It's just the PS number plus four. Like over here, it's the PS1, so it's one plus four, Gen 5. PS2 era is Gen 6, PS3 is Gen 7, so on and so forth. Okay, so the first segment, the cheapest handle that you can get is what you find on Amazon for about 400, 500 rupees. Now these usually come with NES games preloaded. So that's the third generation we talked about, 8-bit games. That's the kind of gaming you can do on these, 401, 501 types. The games, they play fine. You can't save, you can't change what games are preloaded. It is what it is. Now a little higher up on the food chain, you get Linux handhelds. I'm gonna switch to USD pricing from here on out because, you know, while you can still buy these handles in India, there are stores like MX2 Games, uh, E2Z Store who do sell it, but they have their own markups which aren't constant. They vary depending on the brand. So I'm gonna keep the pricing in US dollars so that you get a rough idea of what it should cost and it would make it easier for you to identify what kind of markup you're paying. Or if you wanna buy directly, Ann Burnick, uh, INEO, and a lot of these uh, that are on Indiegogo, they all ship to India. Customs would be extra, of course. This is the segment where you find a lot of Linux handles. The segment and Burnick and PowerKD dominate. Now these handles, they typically run on underpowered chips when you compare to what you find on phones these days. They typically do not have touch screens, though there are exceptions. The handles you get at this price, they can play games up to the fifth generation of consoles, so up to PlayStation 1. This is the segment where you find the likes of the Miu Mini, the Miu Mini Plus, and Burnick RG35XX, and so on. Now, in this segment, you don't really gain much in terms of performance. You do, however, get better, higher resolution screens, better build quality, and a very limited 6th gen gaming compatibility. Now, some GameCube games will run on these, but it's very few and not too well. Now between $150 and $200, here's where we start to find a lot of Android handles. This is the KTR1C, this is the Ein Odin Lite, Retroid Pocket 3, 3 Plus and the Flip, the Anburnic RG405M. With these handhelds, you can get good or at least decent 6th gen support. Now they aren't going to run the entire PS2 catalog perfectly, but you're going to start to see a lot of games run very well and some even at 2x resolution. Guys, here's where you get a lot of form factor choices. Like you could either go for something compact where you have the keys below, this is a vertical handheld, or you could go for something with a horizontal layout. Vertical ones are easy to throw in your pocket, whereas the horizontal ones, they just feel more comfortable to hold and use. This is gonna boil down to personal preference, but again, it's something worth keeping in mind. For example, a flip, easy to throw in your backpack once you're done, you don't even need to have, I mean, this is an extra attachment I have. Oops. 
So once you're done gaming, just close it, throw it into your backpack and be done with it. So that's the different form factors. Now, there is one thing to keep in mind. With 6th gen consoles like GameCube and the PlayStation 2, you might not want to run these games at native resolution, which could be 480p. You're going to want to upscale them, add some anti-aliasing, you know, want to make things look better because some of these games with the right tweaks, they hold up perfectly well today. Now, this is a segment I'm not a huge fan of, not because the devices themselves aren't good, but because, you know, the Windows or Linux devices in this segment are very underpowered. For example, we have the Win 600 here, and it can't even run 6 gen games very well. On the Android side, this segment is home to the likes of the Odin Pro, the Razer Edge, the GPD XP and XP Plus, and these are all fine handhelds. But you don't really end up getting a lot over the $150 to $200 handhelds. Yes, you can upscale better, yeah, they're difficult to run games, start running fine, then you can even play some Android games very well, especially the Razer Edge, for example, does a great job with Android games. But the next device uh, on this list, it's such a game changer that when it came out, it kind of killed this entire segment. And that device is this, the Steam Deck. Given the Steam Deck exists at $400, the temptation to just get a Steam Deck over anything priced between $200 to $400, that's super high. It's super tempting. Because like I said earlier, between $200 and $400, you're still getting 6th generation console emulation. There is no 7th gen emulation on Android yet, with the exception of Nintendo Wii. Uh, the Steam Deck can do almost perfect 6th gen emulation. It can even do a bit of 7th gen emulation. A whole bunch of PS3 games are playable on the deck. And barring that, if you technically think about it, it can even run 9th generation games because 9th generation, it's your PS5, Xbox Series X, and pretty much, I mean, most of those games are available on PC and new AAA games. For example, Cyberpunk 2077, God of War, uh, Hogwarts Legacy, it all runs pretty decently on the Steam Deck. The success of the Steam Deck has in fact resulted in many developers now adding an extra preset. You know how we have uh, graphical settings, low, medium, high, ultra, extreme and all that. Now there's a Steam Deck preset being added. It's, it's just been that popular and these trackpads here, they let you play games that would just not be possible on any other handle, no matter what you paid. And the suspend functionality that Valve has very beautifully implemented, you know, that kind of lets you treat the Steam Deck the way you would a Switch. You know, play, hit suspend, go do something else, come back, almost no battery loss, continue playing. Now, if the Steam Deck is so damn good, why is this segment called $400 to $700? Now, if you were thinking that, it's because of this device here, the ROG Ally. This provides you roughly 15% more performance in the same TDP compared to the Steam Deck. Okay, 15% more, but it's also $300 more. So how does the Ally make sense? Now that's because at 15 watt TDP, this does about 10-15% more, right? But while the Steam Deck maxes out at 15 watts, you can push the Ally up to 30 watts. So when you're maxing out the TDP, battery life be damned, the Ally gives you about 50% more performance with certain games. Uh, again, this varies on a game-to-game -game basis. I'm, generaliz I'm generalizing it a lot, but that's 50% more performance. But again, it costs $300 more. So guess this is where the marketing kind of kicks in. When you're thinking about buying a Steam Deck, in your head, it's gonna be $400. But then you actually go to buy one, then you're thinking, $400, I'm getting 64 gigs, eMMC 5.1, totally unacceptable on a phone. So do I really want a Steam Deck with that? Okay, maybe I should pay for the next queue. So that brings it up to $530. So now if you're looking at a $530 Steam Deck with 256 gigs of storage, and that's when you go, huh, the 512 gig has a etched glass screen, lesser reflections, and it's double the storage, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, why not actually get the Steam Deck, you know, with the edge glass screen, with the 512 gigs of storage. But then at this point, $50 more gets you the Ally. With its 120 hertz screen, full HD resolution, much more compact form factor, extra performance, crappy battery life, but hey, it's got all this going for it. So that is where, why I feel, yes, the Steam Deck is technically $400, the Ally is $700, but the end consumers are gonna have to come, you know, have to make a choice between these two because it's too close, 
to kind of put them in different segments totally. Okay, now coming to the ally, this is the epitome of performance. This is flat out the best performance you can get on any handheld today, no matter what you pay. There are more expensive handhelds, but paying more, you're not gonna be getting better performance. Now it's not just the Ally, you have other alternatives to the Ally. For example, there is a new refreshed version of this, the INEO Geek 1S, that comes with the AMD Ryzen 7 7840U. It's priced the same as the Ally, at least, you know, when you're backing it on Indiegogo. But it's got this Hall Sensor analog sticks, it's got better triggers or at least larger triggers. It's got a lower resolution, lower refresh screen, but it's got a 25% higher capacity battery. Now, on the inside, it's got a 7840U, which has identical performance to the Z1 Extreme. So it's pretty much the same kind of performance. Now, given that I actually have this in hand, this is the last gen INEO Geek. Uh, this is also something worth looking into, not just the INEO Geek, typically the last gen handhelds, which is the 6800U AMD Ryzen 7. Now these, these days you're finding them on sale a lot and you also have a lot of people selling theirs off. Yes, in games you're losing about 10-20% performance in comparison with the Ally. But a lot of these, given that there are new handles coming out, they are available in very good condition, used. You could pick one up for 450 500 ish dollars. Uh, if you're interested in looking for secondhand deals, the best place I would suggest would be on certain Discord servers. I will provide links to these in the description below in case you want to check them out. Okay, now above $700, keep in mind, like I said, above $700, you're spending for certain things, mostly luxury. It's definitely not for performance because the Ally Z1 Extreme, the INEO Geek 1S 7840U, that's the max performance you can get today, no matter what you pay. I've said this already. So anyways, uh, let's say you want a handheld that also doubles as a mini laptop. Then the GPD WinMax 2 2023 offers a 10.1 inch display and it also is a reasonably okay-ish handheld. It's pretty heavy, but it's still doable. $799 for the 7S640U. Say you want something with a smaller screen and a physical keyboard, the GPD Win 4 is pretty much a blown up PS Vita. And it starts at $899, but with a 6800U. This is something you could find a good deal on if you're trying to shop secondhand. Now the AOK Zoe A1 Pro, this offers an eight inch screen with a 65 watt hour battery, a whopping 60 plus percent increase from the ROG Ally. Again, 7840U on the inside. The One X Player 2 Pro is one that's coming up and this will be offering detachable controllers, kinda letting you use it like a switch, same 7840U. Now the INEO 2S, now this is one I've personally been using. This offers large hall sensor analog sticks. It's got this all glass screen front with no bezels around the display. It makes it look very premium. It's again got a higher capacity battery. It feels great in hand and it starts at $949. INEO also offers a 64 gig RAM option with four terabytes of storage. Of course, the price is also super high around $1,700 if I remember correctly. Now, if you don't care about all this, the little things like more RAM, more storage, hall center analogs, extra battery, if you don't care about all this, there's still one major, major advantage that all these Chinese handhelds have over the ROG Ally. Now on the Ally, Asus has chosen not to provide support for USB 4, but instead they give you this. This is a proprietary jack for you to connect an XG mobile add-on. Basically, when you play handheld, Playing 720p low settings might be fine, but if you plan on playing on a big screen after docking your device, then you might want a little bit more performance. In which case, with Windows handhelds, you can add an external GPU, which in the case of the ROG Ally, is the proprietary XG Mobile. The 4090 XG Mobile costs about $2,000. So if you look at buying a handheld and an eGPU to use your handheld as your one gaming solution, if you're going the Asus route, that's gonna set you back $2,700. Now with the Chinese brands, take the INEO Geek 1S, this is not the 1S, but let's assume this is. Let's take this as an example. The handle, it costs the same, $699, but to add an eGPU to this, you're gonna spend about $399 on, on an eGPU enclosure, Razer Core X, $799 on a 4070Ti. Wait. Why am I comparing a 4070 Ti to a 4090? Now that's because the XG Mobile that Asus sells, it uses laptop, laptop GPUs on the inside and a laptop 4090 gives you roughly the same performance as a desktop 4070 Ti, which is what you'd be putting into a normal eGPU enclosure. 
So the total in this case comes to $1,900, which funnily enough is cheaper than the 4090 XG mobiles cost. Now in the future, say when the 5000 series NVIDIA GPUs start coming out, assuming pricing remains unchanged, you'd spend $800 on a 5070 Ti instead of having to pay $2,000 on a 5090 XG mobile unit. Also, if you're using a regular eGPU, if you have any laptop that supports USB 4 or Thunderbolt, then you could just plug that laptop in and also get to use the eGPU for your other laptops. With XG Mobile, you're limited to whatever it is that ASUS is selling. There are some ASUS laptops that do support it, I'm not saying no, but you are limited more. Now, if you're looking for a handheld just for streaming, then the Logitech G Cloud from that dreaded for $200 to $400 segment, it actually works great. Well, it doesn't have the performance chops given Snapdragon 720G is what you find on the inside. That large seven inch screen, full sized analog sticks, it, they kind of make it perfect to stream or cloud game on. And then you have your whole host of first party handhelds like this. Most of them are jailbroken and can easily run Gen 4 and even Gen 5 games, but that's, kind of beyond the scope of this video because guys, I can continue to talk about handhelds all day, but I'm going to have to bring this video to an end at some point. It's already gone on for far too long. So let's stop here. But before you go, let me give you a few resources if you want to kind of, you know, look into stuff yourself. Retro Game Core is an amazing channel that you can check out. Pretty much any device that I've spoken about today, uh, Russ probably has it covered. He's pretty candid with his opinions. I trust his reviews, so he would be a great resource. ETA Prime is a tad more brand friendly, but it's still pretty informational. Now, once you've actually bought a device though, if it's one of the Windows ones, the Fox is absolutely must watch. To get into the nitty gritty and milk every last bit of performance and battery life out of your device, do check out the box. There's also the sheet on Reddit that gives you the specs and performance comparisons for all the devices ever launched. Think of it more as GSM Arena on a sheet, but for handhelds. So I'll leave a link to all of these in the description below, so do check it out if you want more information. So there you go. Uh, this is Gaming Handhelds 101. Hope you found the video useful. If you did, I'm sure you know what to do. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.